to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton here. Today I've got a special guest, one of my colleagues, Grace Cheng from Hawaii Pacific University. We're going to be talking about Grace's research on Africa and China and all sort of parts in between. Uh, so without further ado, welcome to ThinkTech. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me. This is your first time on Think Tech TV, right? Yes, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Hopefully not the last, though. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Depending <laughs> on how things go, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so, Grace, you've been here uh, as a professor, you're an associate professor of political science at HBU. Mm -hmm. You've been at HBU for for quite some time, since mm -hmm. what, the late 90s mm -hmm. or so? That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What brought you, I mean, how did you end up in Hawaii being a professor of political science? I mean, where, where are you from originally is my normal starting question. Okay. Well, I was born in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and my family and I moved to New York City when I was two years old. Um, and I went to university at Georgetown New in uh, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and there I did an internship when I was a junior at um, a refugee camp with the International Organization for Migration. So I was based in the Philippines' first asylum camp in Palawan there, and that's when I started getting very interested in international politics and especially how they impact developing countries. Mm. So um, I had my, my fellow intern at the International Organization for Migration was from Hawaii, and I had several other friends from Hawaii, so you know, we, I had gotten to, to know about the place and I got to know about the programs here at University of Hawaii. So I applied for graduate school here and studied um, political transitions, especially in the context of the post-Cold War trans, uh, uh, transition in world politics and looking how they adjusted. Um, so that was what I came here to do, and then I got a job at Hawaii Pacific University, and here I am still today. Okay, interesting. So, so even before you'd come to Hawaii, there, you'd met people, and it seemed to be a draw for you, in a sense. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And Hawaii was a really attractive place because um, there, I, my, my area of focus initially as a grad student was in Southeast Asia, mm. and the, the, the University of Hawaii has a very strong center for Southeast Asian studies, and so a very vibrant you know, community of, of scholars and, and, and other members of the community there. So it was a really good learning environment and a very good place to kind of take off and, and, and go and, and uh, experience some research, study, travel in the region. Mm. You started originally focusing on Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, mm. I was, um, so the Vietnamese camp, uh, it was actually a Vietnamese refugee camp that I was working in in the Philippines. So that gave me sort of uh, introduction into many different things, but one of them being, you know, uh, what life was like in Vietnam and how the war affected Vietnamese society and politics even into, you know, several decades after the conflict concluded. Mm. And so, you know, how this was reflected in the lives of the refugees, how it affected the region, how it affected and, and was, you know, influencing politics still today at that time. So that was uh, kind of my entryway into studying Southeast Asia because uh, I was interested in the country itself, but also in, in kind of the regional context and how international politics uh, influenced and impacted the region. Okay, interesting. I mean, not, so you started off sort of doing work on Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and then you've sort of moved into doing uh, a, a, a sort of a wide variety of different projects. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know that you teach courses on uh, um, <clears throat> Islam and politics, you teach courses on uh, China, on uh, international law, human rights. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're looking at sort of all the, the different sort of uh, topics, you is there, for you, is there kind of a thread or is it, you know, is it kind of like uh, exploration in a sense for you or do you, do you have a thread that sort of links things together? Like you were here and you got interested in this and then went on to this because you saw commonality in an issue or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, spending a lot of time in Asia and interacting a lot with Asian scholars and members of the community, especially working in different kinds of organizations, you get a very different view of international politics than the, what we study, I think, in the American mm. University and other Western universities as well. And so I've been interested in my work in trying to understand kind of how um, things that I think we often take for granted and in the literature is also sort of unquestioned um, and how, how uh, you know, people in, in developing countries experience those and, and their, their views on, on those kinds of topic areas. So um, because I spend a lot of time in Asia, in the last four years I've become involved in a, an organization called the Asian Resource Foundation, mm -hmm. which is based in Bangkok, and I support them and participate in these peace and conflict uh, workshops that they conduct 
um, mainly for people who work in conflict or post-conflict regions, uh, including gov government, uh, civil society, human rights lawyers, as well as academics doing field research in those kinds of contexts. And so um, learning a, a great deal from how they've experienced uh, their work with trying to, I guess, reconstruct on various levels after conflict, mm. um, you know, economically, physically, politically. And of course, you know, these days, what I'm interested in, what I've always been interested in, I guess the common thread is how international institutions and international politics affects that. Mm. Because um, as I look at, you know, developing countries that are not necessarily very powerful, right? Um, uh, how they're, they're sometimes, you know, not always in the driver's seat you know, in, in some of these transitions. And that's, that's, I think, one of the things that the uh, Asian Resource Foundation is trying to help address, trying to help support and create a network for people around Asia, but also we get, we're getting a lot of uh, participants from Africa and the Middle East as well, how, help them to kind of develop their own uh, approaches to addressing the, the challenges of post-conflict mm. reconstruction and, and, and development and um, helping them to develop these networks um, so through them, I've also recently participated in a, a, an exchange among three institutions in South Asia, um, Tribhuvan University in, in Nepal, uh, University of Huruhuna in Sri Lanka, and Kamsat Institute in Pakistan. And they're supported by a Norwegian fund, which um, is, is helping them to develop programs within those own institutions, rather than what we typically see, which is you know, bringing over people from developing countries to study in Western universities or uh, establishing Western campuses over there. Mm. So in this way to help kind of foster, um, you know, a perspective that, that really comes from the root of the societies which are, are dealing and addressing with these, the, these problems. So one of the things that I find as a common thread throughout this is, um, you know, the struggles that they have as far as, you know, not being in the driver's seat, being mm. being um, materially less well off, less powerful countries, and the you know with international institutions, of course, being very concerned with the impact of of conflicts on communities as well as regional security. Um, they they're playing. They have a greater and greater presence in these in these countries, mm. and so there is that kind of a power dimension, that kind of political dimension that that I'm interested in. Um, and so that is, is kind of one of the common threads that I, I look at. And so my most recent um, research project I've been looking at, I went to a, a conference in Ghana last year, and um, it was the first Africa-Asia studies conference. And, mm -hmm. and part of that, again, is the idea of trying to build bridges across developing countries so that we don't have just, um, you know, the, the link is from developing countries to the West, but without that kind of exchange across the developing world. So that was very fruitful. And my research project uh, is looking at China-Africa cooperation and peace and security, which we are seeing kind of growing, um, mm. especially through the, the forum on China-Africa cooperation. One thing that's interesting is that the nowadays, in the past, say, 10 odd years, there's been a lot of attention in sort of media and the pundit sphere about uh, China's move to Africa and many books, China Safari and all these other things published. I mean, but on the other hand, I mean, there's, there has been, although we don't always perceive it in the West, there's been this long tradition of interaction between China and Africa, whether it's, you know, even the Cold War, the Afro-Asian movement and things like that. I mean, do you mm -hmm. find with your interactions today that this is sort of a continuation of longer ties that have sort of always been there, or is this something new in your mind, or, or a bit of both, or...? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, definitely part of the rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's always kind of preface <clears throat> all of these, these meetings for, for, for example, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC. That sounds kind of odd, but I'll call it's it that. It's shorter. Acronym. I know. It's a little bit shorter. <laughs> than all the, but, you know, that's always the preface of, of all of their, I think, of all the addresses. And there is. There has been a, a tradition of Afro-Asian cooperation, and China during the, you know, during the revolutionary years was active in trying to support liberation movements in Africa. Um, so what's... That I think that kind of connection is is not new, and certainly you know what used to be called third world, right? It's third world solidarity and, mm. and this effort to develop um, sort of an alternate front 
uh, not, not being subject to the more hegemonic blocks. Uh, that's always been there. But what's new is that China is, you know, such a, an economic powerhouse mm. and an emerging uh, military power. Uh, so, you know, China to position itself as a developing country is somewhat problematic. Mm. Um, and, and definitely, you know, the power dimension is there because what, what's there is two-way uh, kind of exchange, though. Uh, I think a lot of us think it's all China going over to, to Africa. And I think for the most part, yeah, there are a lot of you know, Chinese investors, state projects, a lot of Chinese workers and, and other you know, private, private citizens taking initiative going to Africa. But there are a lot of efforts to kind of you know, uh, bring the exchange the other way as well. So that was what was interesting about the conference in Ghana, is that mm. you saw the results of that, like how how much that is uh, thriving. Mm -hmm. um, but there certainly are real material differences and power differences um, between you know, China and the countries of Africa collectively. Mm -hmm. How much too, I mean, do you still see sort of, you know, back in the 90s, if you will, or even into the early 2000s, you know, you used to see this uh, competition between chi China and Taiwan for recognition. And they would sort of do checkbook diplomacy, you know, like, yeah. I'll build you a dam! <laughs> Real China, kind of, or I mean, how many hospitals do you need? I mean, is, is some of the, the current uh, ties today, is there still an echo of that competition that used to go on? Uh, a lot of the places I've been to, I mean, for example, a, a China um, political studies conference uh, took place in Costa Rica a couple of years ago, and right before, Coast, right after Costa Rica switched its recognition from Taiwan to China. Mm, right. Yeah, so th <laughs> this is always there, and you know, very, yeah, this is true in various countries in Africa as well. Um, I mean, so, so one of the things I think that's always uh, th something that, that, that uh, people would like to kind of point out, I mean, that, I think that is part of, of China's uh, agenda, you know, they want the world to recognize that only the Beijing government is is the, well uh, represents the state, and that the state is is unified, including including Taiwan. So, um, but you know, what I found in in the China Africa cooperation was that you know, there they had a, there were a lot of other interests, and not mm. just uh, crude economic interests on China's part, and not just you know trying to you know, wrestle that recognition away from, from Taiwan. Uh, but there were, what I was interested in is some other dimensions of, of why they are cooperating mm. that, that have to do with kind of the changing international political practices that we're seeing, mm. like more interventions, like international uh, institutions getting more involved in, in regional problems and um, how, yeah, they're trying to, I think, I think I think on the African side, they're using or or they see this relationship cooperation with China as a way to kind of help boost their voice in that process. Hmm. So, I mean, one of the shorthands that was always given is that you know for a lot of post-colonial societies, um, quite sort of uh, logically, uh, they have sort of uh, sensitivities about sovereignty. You know, because of having their sovereignty violated mm -hmm. for how many hundreds of years while they were colonial subjects, is that also, in a sense, perhaps a you know uh, an aspect of sort of commonality between a lot of these African countries and China? In a sense, that China is sort of it's an, almost like a meme in a sense that China is very sensitive about about sovereignty. These countries as well, given the colonial legacies and the tendency for developed or Western nations to engage in inter intervention, whether military or political, um, is that also sort of a commonality in the way of like, sort of like how the rules, the international game should operate in a different fashion? Is that, or is that perhaps, again, rhetoric when people get together? Or? No, actually, that's really core to, to what I'm finding and what, what my, uh, I guess, my interpretation of, of the nature of this cooperation is because, I mean, actually, China's role in in like material support for for African peace and security is is much smaller than coming from Western countries, but it's their cooperation at the international institution and political level mm. that's important. And a lot of it has to do with this concept of sovereignty. And I think uh, within Western countries, you know, we talk a lot about human rights in other countries. Like we should speak out when our president visits, they should criticize you know the state leaders about their human rights and try to push them. Um, for yeah, as you were saying, for for former colonial subjects, that's kind of a very very intrusive approach to their political independence, and so that is one aspect of it. But it's no longer this. 
what I what you can see, I think, when you look at the the relationship, the cooperation developing uh, between China and, and Africa bloc, I guess, uh, is that they're I mean they're not pushing for absolute sovereignty. Even China and and China's a little less to, uh, easy to discern as far as its rhetoric, but in practice. You can see because Africa is the African states through the African Union are much more open to kind of conditioning sovereignty to certain mm. you know to certain kinds of uh, performances by the state you know if it, if it's, there's a grave threat to human uh, rights and so forth and security um, but the uh, you know the the African Union and a lot of individual African states and, and commentators, they're very wary of intervention as far as if it's externally led, that is mm. external to Africa, from Africa. So in 2015, the African Union um, called and for a meeting and met with the UN Security Council. They were very, very unhappy with um, the Security Council uh, authorized um, interventions in Cote d'Ivoire and mm. in Libya in 2011. Oh, right. They felt that you know so a lot of their proposals, their perspectives, the concerns they brought brought to the table when discussing those resolutions were not taken into consideration. And especially in Libya, they were really alarmed at how this impacted the the state, the for, you know the mm. the barely existing state these days. Um, so you know they've called for the Security Council to, to say, hey, we, want, we don't want interventions to be something imposed from outside. So there is a, as far as sovereignty is concerned, it's not that they think states sh should not be meddled with at all, but that, you know, the sovereignty, I guess more the, the political independence of African actors vis-a-vis -vis non African actors. Mm. And China has really, I think, been influenced by this, like through their practice and even through some of the scholarly um, writings and, and some of the people participating in parts of the fo FOCAC uh, forums. Okay, interesting. Well, we'll take a, a short break and we'll come right back and continue talking about China and Africa. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state, as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Welcome to thinktechhawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. My focus is Asia in Reveal. We talk about interesting subjects in Asia. Be sure to check the thinktech.com website on the next topic. Thank you. Hello, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm talking with Grace Chang about Chinese and African cooperation on peace and security issues. Before the break, you had been talking to us about sort of this uh, similarities or convergence, if you will, between sort of Chinese and African views about sovereignty and how they relate to international institutions. I'm going to ask you maybe a, a slightly mischievous question uh, now. Um, one of the things that's interesting that you brought up uh, earlier was this kind of paradox, in a sense, of China engaging with Africa as a fellow developing countries, yet at the same time, well, it's true, I mean, China is a, you know, develop, socially, economically, in many ways, a developing country. It's also the second largest economy mm -hmm. in the world now. It's got a very robust, powerful military. It has a very robust, powerful diplomatic presence. So both in hard and soft power, China is becoming maybe not a superpower, but it is certainly very much a, a leading regional power. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I find interesting about Chinese diplomacy is that there is all of these sort of legacies of a sort of revolutionary post-colonial state. Uh, but then at the other, these are somewhat, somewhat sort of awkwardly sometimes reconciled against a country that is now a leading power. Mm -hmm. So what's been interesting to me the past 10 years is how sort of some tenets of Chinese foreign policy have been shifted. So, for example, you know, back in the 90s, you know, China's view about economic sanctions, right? Economic sanctions were an imperialist tool, right? China would never use them. 
seen the past 10 years uh, maybe a, a more willingness to think about economic mm. statecraft. Similarly with overseas bases, right? Overseas mm. bases is something the Americans have in, in, in Asia that are part of an imperialist power. Now China is talking about places and not bases, bases and not, not bases, <laughs> but places abroad in places, uh. whether it's Djibouti and other places on the string yeah. of pearls and so on yeah. in the Indian Ocean. I mean, how do you, how do you see this sort of interesting um, balancing that China is doing? between this sort of revolutionary developing country rhetoric with sort of, dare I say, sometimes the needs or the desires of a strong regional power that would like to act as a strong regional power might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Big question. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of uh, the literature we have in this country about China, um, as well as, you know, the public uh, kind of popular representations. Yeah, China is an emerging world power and and so doing those typical things to kind of uh, that, you know, in order to protect its interests as it projects those interests everywhere overseas, especially economic, because uh, as we are hearing a lot about, right, China seeking resources and markets and other places to invest overseas. And so that it's a rational, it kind of parallels that development that they would they would want to enhance their presence that way. Um, so I think, you know, that, that's certainly, I think, something that, you know, is a part of what's happening. Um, but I think because they're, they have, I think because they have this kind of close cooperation with the African states through the FOCAC, I think in this case, you know, the African states did a very good job themselves also to, to, to make this uh, forum something where they can, you know, express African perspectives and not just, it not just being a, a China-dominated, China-led forum where China can kind of impose its presence, its preferences. And so as I was saying before, I mean, I think um, that because, you know, because China hasn't become aligned with the other world powers, Right, it hasn't like adopted and conformed to Western, you know, Western modern practices uh, and policy, you know, positions. So it's it's you know it doesn't want to. I think it doesn't uh, believe in some of these things like political conditionalities and mm. intervention the way that Westerners understand it. So it it needs to kind of seek. Um, that kind of relationship with with other countries, and so I think through this forum, they're you know they're being sort of actually influenced a lot by their experiences in Africa, like having you know a lot of workers. So unlike I think unlike Western investors uh, that invest in Africa, um, you know Chinese investments come with a lot of Chinese workers, which mm. is one of the criticisms, is that they don't use local labor. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, as a consequence, they see that, you know, their presence is problematic. Like, they have to think about the power relations that are physically there in the communities where they're, you know, they're bringing their interests. Um, they see attacks on their nationals who are working over there. They see attacks on their investments. Um, they have to be a lot more wary of, you know, being an outside power coming in. And I think that the way that they're experiencing it, experiencing it in Africa is, is very different from the way I think Westerners have because of the physical presence of, of more Chinese mm. moving in there. And, um, you know, and one of the things, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of acti economic activities that China is engaged in, um, you know, one of the things is they're engaged in a lot of infrastructure, very direct development projects, and so they're physically much more present that way also, and mm. that's one of the differences, whereas I think, you know, in the past, some of the other um, interests haven't been, you know, willing to kind of lay down those kinds of, of uh, projects and, and construction on the continent. Okay, interesting. Uh, one other thing, uh, maybe to, to, to problematize a bit more, uh, I think is interesting, is that one of the criticisms often that people make when we, as people in the developed world, the Western world, when we look at Africa, we tend to treat Africa as like some sort of unitary, mm -hmm. unitary unit, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just one country, even though it's a continent mm -hmm. with many countries. I mean, do you find in your research and experiences that there are some 
interesting nuances or differences between on the sort of sub-regions of Africa or the different countries that, con you know, Nigeria thinks this way, Ghana that way, or something like that? Do you, have you found sort of interesting differences in how Africa reacts and then interacts with China? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, when the African Union was created to kind of uh, succeed the Organization of African Unity in the early 2000s, uh, the idea was sort of to bring back a pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. and I think that's not been unproblematic. I mean, there there are the, the national interests, or st at least state interests, mm -hmm. not necessarily national, because sometimes there are differences within the states. Um, there's definitely um, power differences among the states in the on the continent. Some some economically and military much more powerful than others. So I think that's, uh, as far as a pan-Africanist um, vision, that's something to aspire to. And, and wh whether, you know, that's go we're going to keep moving forward to that or see, see the African Union move forward, that we're, we'll see. Because they're, they're undergoing a change in leadership currently. Mm. Um, so the, the past leadership has been very much, you know, supporting China. Um, integrate the, the, the region more. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I think it, uh, has, has been problematic economically is that African economies are more linked to outside economies than they are with each other. So they're trying to promote that a great uh, more. And, and, you know, there are a lot of material issues, you know, practical issues with, with getting there. And, you know, I think the political, the political will and interest in that project, mm. I think, is there. I think there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of issues to be worked out, however, you know, at the same time. So, yeah, definitely, you know, to say that there's one coherent, unified voice, mm -hmm. um, that's not, uh, you know, always practical to say that that, mm. that exists. One thing kind of to develop this theme further, I mean, one of the other, we talked about kind of, I don't know, stereotypes or memes about China. One that often comes up is when China deals with, say, like Southeast Asia. Um, China mm -hmm. seems to have a preference, as most large powers do, to try mm -hmm. and deal with smaller powers bilaterally rather mm -hmm. than in a multilateral mm -hmm. forum yeah. where the smaller powers might be able to more counteract China's yeah. influence. Do you see a similar dynamic with China interacting with the African Union and African countries, or is it totally different? I think it's very different. I mm. think that's one of the interesting things to kind of eventually look at more closely is that it's very different. The approach that China has in its own, you know, neighborhood, mm -hmm. right, is... is um, it, there's a longer or at least more intimate history, we could say, uh, mm -hmm. with that uh, versus its, its kind of uh, relations that, that are developing on the African continent. And as I said, I think the African states uh, as a group, as well, you know, as well as the African Union, have done a good job in kind of creating a, you know, a, a more African-led agenda. Although, of course, problematic to say that there's any pure unified voice, but, you know, as far as representing Africa and its relations with, with China, very different from what's going on in Southeast Asia. Okay, interesting. All right, well, we've got more we could talk about, but that's all the time that we have today on Global Connections. But Grace, thank you very much for joining us and talking to us about, about topics that we don't always think about here in Hawaii. And with that, I will see you guys next week on Global Connections.